Welcome to The Manly Catholic. In this podcast, we will inspire, challenge, and equip all men to become the men they were created to be. Join us as we journey together to become the best versions of ourselves and strive to change our communities one man at a time. Hello, all. Welcome to another episode of The Manly Catholic. I'm James, your host, and with me... He came back, folks. Dan McNally. And I'm Dan, your guest. Dan, welcome to the Manly Catholic. Thank you, James. How are you doing? I'm well. How was your mother's Mother's Day? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I was there. I think it was good. I'm just like, <laughs> you said, how was her mother? I'm overthinking that one. You you were. It was lovely. Uh, they, see? That's all I need to know. I got, her, to hear I got her flowers. <gasps> Good job. What kind of flowers? I don't remember. Okay. We should probably stop rambling. We can <laughs> How was uh, tangents. Okay. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we will be talking about dating Whoa. and in the relation to chastity. James, are you dating care. anyone right now? Yes, I'm dating my wife. Whoa, love it. Before we dive into the topic, Dan, would you like to do the traditional prayer to St. Joseph? For chastity. I would love to. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. All right. Well, let's start our prayer as we start all things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Joseph, Father and Guardian of Virgins, to whose faithful keeping Christ Jesus, innocence itself, and Mary, the Virgin of Virgins, was entrusted, I pray and beseech you by that twofold and most precious charge by Jesus and Mary to save me from all uncleanness, to keep my mind untainted, my heart pure, and my body chaste, and to help me always to serve Jesus and Mary in perfect chastity. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So we wanted to do this topic because it's obviously something that... Um, our culture especially, I think, has a, a huge misconception of, like, the purpose of dating and, um, you know, chastity, like I mentioned in, in the beginning. You know, chastity in particular is not just for uh, folks who are single, but also for married people as well, such as myself. So I think dating is is a precursor to, to what we want to see in, in our marriage. So the purpose of dating, I guess, to, to just break it down the purpose of dating is to find your spouse right Uh so you know folks who date in high school or college i mean you really should not truly be dating until you're ready to find a spouse right so i mean you can make what about what about high school sweethearts james yeah so and then what does that look like because people i mean inevitably people are dating in in high school and i mean middle school but i mean you can make the argument i mean some people i mean people used to get married a lot earlier than that's true now okay so Mm -hmm. i i would say too i mean the the idea of a high school sweetheart i mean i have no problem with that i think it depends on the maturity level of the person that's fair so and and the reason for that is that dating i mean inevitably can lead to uh, temptations to mm. uh, fornication or participating in uh, sexual acts that are not conducive except for uh, in the context of marriage. Mm-hmm. And James, why do we want to save that for marriage? Why do you think Why is the Catholic Church so against sex? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's a great question because I mean, I don't I mean, there's so many people like we're all the, the audience here is I would assume largely Catholic and maybe we've been brought up just it's a given. Yeah, you, you wait to till marriage to have sex. But like I think there's a lot of people that haven't even considered that as a possibility. Like their worldview and their anthropology is so different. And so even if we're having a conversation with someone, perhaps someone who's not raised Catholic or doesn't understand kind of our anthropology, is to take a second and put ourselves in their shoes because some people as crazy as it feels like to me to even think about that, some people have not considered that at all. Have not been raised in an environment where you know, there's a stability in that area or any sort of education and, and support in that area. And they're kind of just figuring it out on their own. And so, I mean, how would you respond to someone who's just never even heard this idea before? Like, oh, like, wow, you're not having sex until you get married? Like, that's crazy. Like, one, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. Two, why? You know? Yeah, so a couple, I guess, questions within that is so why do you do that is i think you can just look at 
I guess what has gone wrong with the whole you can have sex with whoever you want. Okay. Right. So the sexual revolution is kind of when the whole idea kind of really blew up, I guess you could say. I mean, obviously that was going on beforehand, but you know, I, I, I would I would not say that people who are sleeping around, um, not really committing to a relationship, I would not say they're they're really happy. I think there are a lot of broken people out there. And I don't think, yeah, I think that's true. I think there's a, an experience of brokenness and I don't think if someone is confronted on that, for example, that, that that's something that, that they would want to immediately admit no, to like, Oh, you're not. totally right. I made a big, yeah. you know, this is a mistake. It's like approaching it from a standpoint of compassion. It's like that sort of lifestyle. A lot of the time, I mean, that, that can really hurt people. Oh, hundred percent. like, yeah. Right. Well, I think a lot of times too, it's, if if you are participating in that, I think it, it just you're searching for something. It's very Augustinian. What he's do you mean? he's seeking at, well like like Saint Augustine, just seeking <laughs> oh sure seeking God without realizing that he's seeking God, exactly. looking for love, looking no, for affection. It, yeah, no, exactly. I think I think we we all have a God sized hole in our heart, mm-hmm. and we fill it with. I mean, we're we're talking about chastity and and dating and sex today. But I mean, people fill it with money. People fill it with their their job. People yeah. fill it with gambling. So this is just one section of that. But you're you're searching for something that can only be filled by God. And when you fill something that's only designed for God, naturally, it's just going to lead to brokenness because we are mm-hmm. naturally broken people since the fall, mm-hmm. and only God can fix that communion that was broken. Yeah. So I think then. Turn it so so why so yeah why why do you all wait? that said why wait like let's like what if you know you're dating someone and you just love them and you know this feels very natural this is the next step here we go why why am I waiting so a couple of reasons for that too is one the natural end game of sex is the procreation of children yeah it's not a side effect it is the main event it is literally the main purpose of of having sex. Right. And that's, that's, I think the very obvious first reason. Right. And, you know, I think our society too has, has forgotten about that because of contraception, because Mm -hmm. of, because of abortion and things like that. So I think a lot of people don't think about that. Right. Because they've kind of just been indoctrinated from our culture. It's like, Oh, well there's all these things to prevent that. So don't worry about it. Right. And sex is almost, we've almost taken a completely different view of it. I think like, I I mean, this is an uneducated, this is me speaking from an uneducated standpoint, but perhaps a, reasonable one prior to contraception it would it would appear to me that sex would have been much more i guess i don't know if the right word is revered or respected or taken in its proper place as something of of great power and sorry i'm about to go into spider-man with great power comes great responsibility but it's true uncle ben was very wise and yeah i mean before we (laughs) before we had the technology to essentially divorce sex from procreation um we had a very natural understanding of it and now and now if a child is produced a lot of the time it's like oh well this was an error this is a mistake and it's totally messed up our anthropology it's messed up our worldview on who we are as people and what sex is in the first place and so i think that's that's a really good point is the contraceptive mentality has made people say well well, then what's the problem because prior to contraception you could make a very easy argument well how about you're making a baby. So either you've got a baby now yeah. or it leads to an abortive mentality, which is, you know, even worse. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think too, in the context of marriage as well is because, you know, when I'm, again, ma- the, even the, the, the definition of marriage, or I guess the, the sacredness of marriage has changed mm. over the years as well too, because it was, it was very natural for, you know, when you, when you commit, to being married to someone was that was truly for life, mm-hmm. you know, and then a divorce nowadays is, I think it's like 50% of married mm-hmm. people end up in divorce. I mean, the last that's time at least I, the I statistic that, that it's gets been thrown around yeah, for the exactly. last 30, I'm 40 sure years it's changed by now. But I mean, but the point is that maybe it's worse, you know, know, it, when you're committed to somebody and, and you, you produce and, and you, you participate in the in the sexual act. I mean, naturally, children are going to come from that. It, if you want to think of the practical reason, the only reason that we should have sex in the context of marriage is to protect children, mm-hmm. too. Because, again, when you, what you talked about is before 
you know, the contraception and abortion was, was really mainstream. Um, you know, the, the men was basically expected then to protect the wife and the child as well. But nowadays, Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, we can talk about the fatherlessness going on as well in our culture, but the father now is expected to be the one to, to be the provider and the protector. And I think that whole mindset too has, has changed quite a bit. Uh, again, just because a man can now just say, well, okay, yeah, we, we produced this baby, but now you can just go abort it. Mm-hmm. And so that whole responsibility for man, I mean, I, mean, I think the, one of the big misconceptions, because I think the argument for contraception is that kind of even the playing field with women for men, but actually it, it gave men more power in a sense, because then it's just, you know, it, how am I trying to say this? It's It's basically... Well, I mean, it took men off off the hook. That's what I meant. Yeah, it took them off the hook versus it used to be, again, expected that if you got a woman pregnant, you would stay with her, uh, marry her if you hadn't already married her. Right. And then you take that responsibility because that was your, your duty and your job. But nowadays, it's, again, that is, it's more of like a cultural shift, I think, when it comes to marriage and chastity and, and sexuality than than it used to be. Yeah. And I was thinking more about what you said with like the fact of like that culture by design, well, maybe not, I don't know if by design is the right way to say it, but kind of by design, like the, the kind of sleeping around sort of behavior. Uh, one, if you're having sex, you're being bonded hormonally, right? You've got all these hormones being released in your body. And you mentioned like, Oh man, like it's, it's, I had someone describe it to me too. It's like, when you break up with someone that you've had an intimate sexual relationship with, uh, especially if, you know, there's abuse or, th- or something like in that situation, it's like, it's, it's almost physically painful, right? Like there's, there's a lot of bonding that goes on in that situation. Um, and the separation afterwards is, is so much more painful and the trauma takes a lot more time, I think, to recover from, um, literally just from a, from a hormonal perspective, um, but I think there's so many other things too. I think the other, another element of the misery of, of, a, of that kind of lifestyle is, I mean, I think we all want, I'll speak for myself, but I think we all want stability. We all want to be able to ro- trust that someone that we love is going to be there. And so I think it's that element of, while it can, again, it's, it's kind of a quaint mentality. It's kind of a quaint idea like, Oh, that's so sweet. You're waiting till marriage to have sex. That's so cute. That's so whatever. Um, what you're saying by doing that is saying, I am not going to give myself completely to you with my body until I have made a promise to give my whole life to you in every other way. Right. Not until you have that commitment of, which again, like, I feel like commitment is kind of out the door too. I feel like we've, there's a, and again, I'm, I wish I were the historian that could give you all of the elements that play into that. But I just feel like as a, as a much more atomized culture, we're, we're very much about being independent. We're very much, you know, I, I just feel like our particular culture is individualistic and that doesn't help. Um, doesn't help that either. Um, yeah. I, I, you mentioned too, just, you know, the sleeping around mentality and I was listening to, I think it was a therapist and they were talking about, you know, men, just men and women's brains are, are totally different. So like men can compartmentalize Mm -hmm. certain things. So, um, like, so if, if a man is sleeping around, it's easier for him to separate Mm -hmm. like the emotions from the attachment to the woman by and large. Yeah. But a woman, it's almost impossible for her. So she when when she has sex with another man, she has now a hormonal emotional attachment to that man and Mm -hmm. like it'll always be there with her yeah and so i i think just just our our biology then if you think about that mentality difference between men and women i mean that's very that can be very damaging for Mm -hmm. a woman and i think that's the i think that's the mindset we need to maybe approach this from is like when we're approaching the idea of sex and when two people who love each other approaching the idea of sex like getting the question of like, am I being used or am I being loved? And right. on the on the contrary, like, am I using this person or am I loving this person? And I don't, I think there's a lot of overlap and a lot of gray area. We're 100%. human, we're broken, we're fallen. But it's like, what is the, so if somebody is asking, why is it not okay for me to do this? Essentially, the, the flip side of that is like, I want to do this. So 
why do we want to do this? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, biological predisposition feels good, naturally oriented towards it. Okay, great. But that's all kind of the subconscious, you know, lizard brain part of us. Why does the frontal lobe of your brain, why does your soul, why does the person want to choose to do it as well? Is it just a like a, oh, I'm so in love with this person and this just feels like the right next step because maybe I'm conditioned by my culture to say, oh, you love someone, you have sex with them, right? I think that's a worthwhile conversation to have is like, what is your intention? Like, why, why are you going forth with this? And again, I think, I think everybody's going to have a different answer to that question, but I think that's a really great question to to talk about with somebody is, is to just say, well, why, why? Because they ask, well, why can't I? It's like, well, why do you want to? Right. And then you can kind of channel that in the direction of, okay, well, it's a good desire, right? It's a great desire. It's a natural desire. So how do we orient that towards the greatest good for ourselves, for the person that we're engaged with, for all the people in our lives? Um, chastity in the catechism is actually talked about as like a schooling in self mastery, which I think is a way cooler way to describe it than just like, Oh, it's the thing where we don't have sex. Right. And again, chastity is not even that like chastity applies to married couples. Chastity applies to single people. Chastity applies to celibates. Chastity applies in different ways. And it's about, it's really beautiful. It actually reminds me of a book that you recommended to me a while ago, the, um, comfort crisis Mm -hmm. and how, a lot of us are depressed and anxious because we don't even do anything that challenges us anymore. And it leads to this state of just, I mean, kind of misery because we're not being challenged. We have no sense of confidence because we haven't, we don't accomplish things that are hard anymore. Right. And the, I think that's what chastity challenges us in is do the thing that's hard. Cause I will say like waiting till marriage, it's very hard. It's hard. Right. Well, I think too, in the greater context of, of the church. I mean, that's what the beauty of the church is. I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas always talks about controlling your, your passions with your reason. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, so if we are ran by our emotions, mm-hmm. natural disaster is just yeah. going to occur. We, we, t- we, I mean, cause I th- Aquinas, I think it, it, it was who talked about our, our brain can only focus on, psychologically like one thing at a time so like Mm. if our emotions are overwhelming us we can't make reasonable decisions and so that's when he would say okay when you when you recognize you're having that overwhelming emotional response that's when you need to step back because your reason is not is being controlled by your emotions not the other way around and so you talk about chastity too and yeah, it says this is from the catechism. It says chastity includes an apprenticeship and self mastery, which oh, is a that. training in human love freedom. It. And he says man's dignity therefore requires him to act out of conscious and free choice, as moved and drawn in a personal way from within, and not by blind impulses in himself or by mere external constraint. And so then he says, um, either man governs his passions and finds peace, or he lets himself be dominated by them and then becomes unhappy. Mm. So it says, then, the virtue of chastity comes under the cardinal virtue of temperance, which seeks to permeate the passions and appetites of the senses within reason. But then it says, self-mastery is a long and exacting work, so one can never consider it acquired once and for all. It presupposes renewed effort at all stages of life. So it's not easy, guys out there, guys and gals out there who are listening. We're not saying this is easy. We're not saying it's... You know, you you just start praying about it and all of a sudden like, hey, uh, my passions are under control. Like we understand how difficult this is. But- and and I want to add to that point too. You know, you see this every day. I, I love Father Jacques Philippe, uh, Searching oh, yes. For and Maintaining Peace. Yes. He really hammers this home. But you see it in a lot of the saints is the devil really wants you to be discouraged and wants you to be feel ex- experience shame for your faults, for your failures. Because again, when we talk about chastity, there's a whole world that we're talking about. It's it's not just, you know, saving yourself from marriage with sex. It's it's being chased in all variety of ways. And, and there's a lot of ways that we can fall short of that. But that's not, I, I think one thing that a lot of us do, myself included, that when we have failures in this area, like it's very easy to go internal. It's very easy to feel isolated. It's very easy to feel like God hates us. It's very easy to feel like we're a failure if we make a mistake. I think it's easy to get legalistic. And I think the one, the one just resounding kind of voice of truth that comes back every time is don't lose your peace. Don't let shame take over. The Lord still loves you in in your, in your imperfections. Right. And like he was, James was just saying from the, 
from the catechism. Like it's a long, what was it? It was a, a long and exacting process, yep. something along those lines. It is. And again, I'm here as a friend and, and fellow Catholic, but like I'm no expert and I'm no saint yet. But another thing too is to remember, yeah, maintain your peace and remember that you're not alone. There's a really beautiful scripture verse and I'll, I'll look it up before we're done here where it, it just, it talks about this struggle in faith and remember those around the world who are also going through this, this struggle. Um, remember that you're not alone. And I think that's the beauty of, of this podcast too. And, and podcasts like it, where we're just trying our best to support each other, lift each other up in word and in prayer. Um, and so that's, I think two takeaways from that is like, we can't lose our peace. If we fall, we get back up right away and, uh, remember that you're also not alone. The devil wants to isolate and he wants to make you experience shame. If you, you go all the way back to Genesis when, <laughs> I mean, you think about Adam and Eve, the very first fall, which a lot of people want to associate specifically with chastity, but you know, there's different interpretations. Um, that what the devil had done from the start was he wanted them to experience shame, right? That was the first thing they experienced. And he wanted them to be isolated. They hid from God, right? And any time that we feel like we're being, that we have to hide from God or that we have to run from God, we can know that that motivation is not from God. 100%. God is pursuing us. God is drawing us towards himself. And anything that makes us feel like we have to run from him is incorrect, well, again, that goes just back to St. Thomas Aquinas then when you feel that shame and that loneliness. Because we know God is always, like you said, drawing. Mm. He's always calling to us. So we know that is, that's a fact. Yeah. And so when you have those those doubts, you're struggling with the same thing over and over again. And you start to get that doubt within yourself and that shame and I'm not good enough. Yeah. Again, you know that's a lie because you know what the truth is. You know right. the truth is God is always calling you. He's always going to welcome you back. I mean, obviously, you need humility to admit that you're wrong, to, yeah. to admit that you need help. But as soon as you do that, you recognize God's grace. Mm. And so there's I, so much freedom in that. There's so much freedom in that. And it's not like a it's not by any means like a get out of jail free card. It's like, well, mm -hmm. I can just keep messing up and God's always going to welcome me back. Like, that's not the point, because, again, that all the virtues. Well, that's I mean, that's presumption, too. Right. Yeah, that's well, the opposite yeah. of despair is well, like exactly. And that's that's not rooted in a relationship with God either. Yeah, absolutely not. Right. Despair. You're running from God. Presumption. You're not talking to God. Yeah. If you're just assuming. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think we've all fallen in both of those 100%. before. But yeah, it's it's helpful to clarify those things. It's it's like a roadmap. Because whenever I end up in those areas, I'm like, I think I'm good. And then it's just, no, dude, I'm miserable. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> to get back to the to the point on on the idea of like sex and preserving the good. Again, I think it's it's just so, there's such a beauty in asking, digging into the questions of like, what is this rooted in? Why do we want community? Why do we want union? Why do we want to not be alone? Why do we want to love? And like, the beauty of, I, I don't remember where I first experienced or I first heard this, but the description of our God as Catholics, like our God is a Trinity. Our God is not one. We're not strict monotheists, right? We don't believe in just God, like one. We do. <laughs> I'm going directly against the creed by saying we don't believe in one God. That's literally the first thing we say <laughs> in the creed. In but no, we do believe in one God, but the God we believe in is a Trinity of persons, right? And so the, the amazing thing about sex itself, about a man and a woman coming together and creating life as it is an icon of the Trinity. It is a sacrament of the Trinity, right? So this exchange of the father and the son throughout eternity and the love between them is, is like a third is a new person. Yeah. It's crazy. It's so beautiful. And like being rooted and and just steeped in, in that understanding and that anthropology of, of human life is crazy. And the world is full of, broken versions of that icon but that doesn't mean that it's not true and that it doesn't exist and it's not what we're called to and it's it's not i think it's a reminder that like underneath all of the hard stuff and all of the brokenness like we are made for goodness and we are made for beauty and we are made in the image of beauty and love and communion and from a philosophical and not hormonal or biological <laughs> perspective from a purely spiritual perspective i think our the draw of, of wanting to, to have this intimate communion is because God is not just one God selfishly there by himself demanding things of us. Mm -hmm. He is 
he is we. He is a communion of persons, and we're made in the image of communion. And that, so we're made for it. And I just, sorry. I get, I nerd out a little bit sometimes when I talk about the Trinity. Keep nerding out. Oh, dude. It's, it's what it's about. And so, yeah, going back to the idea too of like approaching like a relationship, is it, is it, am I looking at this as like, what can I get out of this? How far can I go? What can we do? What can we not do? It's like, how am I preserving, um, this person, this person that I love? How am I preserving their, I don't know. I don't know the right word for it. You know what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do. And I'm uh, looking up. Well, because like we were talking about, like if, if you're in multiple relationships and it's just hard every time and there's these just these wounds because we've tied ourselves to a person, we've been torn apart from that person over and over again. And it's like, how can I preserve this person? Because if I'm not committing my life to them yet, if I haven't committed my whole life to them yet, what do I have a right to? You know? Well, it goes back to a couple things. The second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor, right? And then so mm-hmm. to what what is to love, you yeah. know, St. Thomas Aquinas, to love is to will the good of the other. Mm. And then touching on what is the purpose of us dating, mm-hmm. John Paul II, especially for men out there, it says it is the duty of every man to uphold the dignity of every woman. Oh, I love that. I love that quote. My dad that, used to. <laughs> that always hits me hard because yeah. like that is our job as men. It's not just for your 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 wives for those of you who are married it's not just for the people you're dating but it's for for all women mm-hmm. right and so we always need to treat women with respect and dignity because that's what god calls us to do mm-hmm. he calls us to love every woman obviously not like your your spouse i mean there's different types of love <laughs> which we can talk about. That could be a, could go down a, a rabbit hole there, which we don't want to go down. That was great though. But, but no, our, our, our job is as men is to, is to hope the best for every single woman that we encounter. Mm-hmm. Right. And so same thing for dating is if you're dating this person and you're, and you're asking us, well, how far can we go? You're you're totally missing the point because then you because mm-hmm. you can just flip that and it's like okay are you am right. I treating this woman with respect with dignity when I'm asking myself that question or am I just using her? So I have a spicy question for you. Oh yes. Do you feel ready for a spicy question? No, but let's do it. Let's do it. So the question is so okay I've I have friends who take the dating situation way differently from us as Catholics and are just mm-hmm. totally fine with whatever and don't really see the point. Um, and I also have friends who didn't kiss until they got married. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel like the line is drawn? Because like if someone is dating and then they're engaged and then they're this, like, obviously there's a very clear line in the sand of like, you know, you don't have sex until you're married, Mm -hmm. but do you just sit on opposite ends of a bench the whole time? How do you navigate that? And cause I think there's a line from Augustine that, he says, the man who has, I, I hope I get this right. The man who is lost in his passion is less lost than the man who has lost his passion. And I think the point being like, I'm no Augustinian scholar. He, I, it, 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 I, I get the sense from it that it's like, there will be mistakes. You're acting in love. And if you kind of go with your conscience and if you step over a line, okay. You just have to kind of go with your conscience and then, and I think good communication and good listening to your own conscience is pretty crucial in that space. Conscience is a scary thing to talk about too, because conscience is not just a line on a paper that we can be like, that's the thing and know that it's true. It can also takes be a, deceived. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of, I, I would say study, mm-hmm. but I'm over talking after I already asked you a question. So no, I'm curious to your thoughts on it that. It is a good question and it, I always like, I hate to say it depends on the person, but that's the right answer. <laughs> no, it's true because what, it, what do you struggle with? Right. right so, right. and, and you need to have that open. So if, if this is a, a woman or a man that you're like, okay, I'm 99.9% sure we're going to get married or maybe you're mm-hmm. already engaged. Right. Yeah. And so you might tell your, the other person, Hey, when we start kissing more than just like a peck, Mm-hmm. I can't control myself. Like I, I okay. want to keep advancing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, there are other people that, you know what, like when we're, we're touching, we're holding hands, I'm totally fine. I can stop, mm-hmm. you know? So it really just depends on, on you and the individual. And that's, 
again, going into that self mastery of chastity yeah. that we talked about is knowing what, what, because obviously there are drawings that you can't cross. Like we talked about fornication, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also other things, you know, like masturbation. Yeah. I'm um, doing that to each other too. Like obviously that sure. is a line you should not, you cannot cross. Right. Um, well, and I've, I've heard it said, and tell me if you've heard this, like, and I get, this is real talk, but I appreciate it because I feel like a lot of the time we just kind of speak in like very cute, trite, like sayings and, and don't really give answers. Oh, well, yeah, we're physical that, therapists. So we just go right to the anatomy. <laughs> we go right, right to, exactly. Yeah, which, well, no, because it's helpful for people, I think. Well, yeah. And it's nice to hear people talk like human beings and not just talk like, oh, well, be just be chaste. Like, what does that even mean? Like, yeah. I, when I was a theology teacher, a lot of the time my students on tests when they didn't study, like, they would just write. And I love them to death, but I will make fun of them for this. Uh, like, there would be a very technical, like, just theological question. I don't know. It was a class that merited it. It was morality or sacraments or something. And they did not know the answer at all. And they were just, like, they, I mean, it was like freshmen. And they would write something like, uh, just follow the example and path that Jesus has set and walk in his paths or something like that. And it was so... A lot of words that didn't mean it was thing. so painful, but I think that's what a lot of people get. I think, well, maybe not a lot of people, but like, I think sometimes we, we can sort of generalize like the homilies that we've heard or the talks we've listened to. And like, even sometimes the language of the translations of the Bible that we're reading, that just feel very kind of flowy and yep. highfalutin and just not on our level. Yeah, exactly. And not clear. Mm-hmm. I've So back to the question, I've also heard it said... Like, if you're not married, they're like, don't do anything that is deliberately, like, moving towards mm. sexual activity. Like, yep. deliberately stimulating. But th- but even that is, like, a hard question. It is very hard. Be- and yeah. it goes back it to what you said. Hard. Like, everybody's different, and it yeah. is a subjective experience. It's yeah. a conscience thing. It's a communication yeah. thing. And it's a... um like spiritual direction thing. Oh, 100%. I think I so I think those are three really good guidelines to go by, which doesn't feel like a concrete answer, but it is. I think you need to pray about it and kind of seek that for yourself. I think you need to talk to the person that you're dating about it uh and communicate what they're experiencing and what they're what w- is working and what is not, right. what is tempting them to some to take in that line a little too far and talk to your spiritual director as well, one that you trust if you have one or at least Maybe a trusted spiritual like mentor or friend to maybe check in and be like, is my conscience like totally skewed? Yeah. You know, I think those are three really good guidelines. Well, that's, a, that's the importance too of having someone that you can trust that you can talk to about. Right. Because we we can one, we can justify ourselves when we shouldn't be, and two, we can also yes. be too hard on ourselves exactly when we, when we shouldn't be. And and there is a there is a beauty in the physical intimacy I think that is appropriate for kind of the step of the relationship you're in. Absolutely. And that's the tough thing too. Cause like you could be having this conversation with a 16 year old or you can right. have be having this conversation with a 32 year old right? who like, like for me, like I am dating, I'm not married, but it's like, I have an established job and I am looking to get married. Yeah. So the process for me probably is going to be a little bit faster, a little bit I don't, I don't want to say more mature. I, I consider myself to be a very immature person in a lot of ways. But I'm, I just speak that by way of contrast to say like just those two examples from age alone in terms of your part of life, what job you have, what your prospects are going forward, like is a very different conversation. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Excuse you. <laughs> I think I hit, a, I hit a – I struck a chord there. Wow, literally. Yeah. Wow, I might have hiccups now. And now I lost I'm gonna, train I'll, I'll, I will carry the conversation if you need me Gosh, to. Gosh, dang it. No, I could just... I, I'm good. What was I going to say? Oh, no, it depends on the age of the person, too. So, like, you, like, I think that's a really good point. Like, a 16-year-old versus, like, a 25, 26-year-old, the type of conversation you're going to be having is way different, mm-hmm. you know? So, I would... Gosh, you could even probably just generalize people who are younger, where their hormones are more immature yeah, yeah. and more likely to kind of fly off the rails a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. I'm, I would probably tell them, like, hey, you need to really be careful. And right. maybe it is. Like, hey, you need to sit on the opposite sides of the couch. I mean, maybe not that li- maybe not that far. But right, what right. I'm saying, though, <laughs> is, you know, like a, a 26-year-old is a hopefully more mature. But they can also recognize more like, hey, I recognize that this is leading to something. And I can stop or I can put an end to it before it gets there. Right. Whereas, like, a 16-year-old, like, that's probably that, that ability to stop. 
is probably not going to be there. So yeah. you need to have those parameters in place. Yeah. So So here's a question. Oh. I think um coming from a very conservative religious background, mm -hmm. I m spicy statement number 2. I feel like a lot of people from a from similar background to myself are very very fearful in this space. So to take to take the opposite end from like well how do you approach conversation with somebody about this who has never even thought about you know virginity and saving themselves from marriage or whatever go to the opposite end of the extreme how do you have the conversation with somebody who is all about it but my question kind of becomes like I think it's very easy for some people to live motivated by fear rather than motivated just by like freedom and and love. So I how do we approach the topic of like loving this other person? <laughs> it's a it's a, like a juggling act. Loving this person well, what is the appropriate physical intimacy for where we're at and for who I am and for who they are? Um and not constantly being afraid of like, oh, I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. Because I feel like for a lot of people growing up in, in I don't, I don't want to call it chastity culture, but I'll call it that. Uh, a lot of people are very like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm messing up. I'm doing I'm something wrong. I'm, yeah, a scrupulosity. That's yeah. a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good question. I mean... And is, is the it, scrupulosity bad? I feel like it is. <laughs> isn't it always? It's I think a, it is. Yeah, yeah. Sin. Scrupulosity is a sin. Oh, yeah. no, and that's a sin, too. Yeah. I have to confess that also. <laughs> See? Exactly. I just so, went to confession. I mean, I guess in the in the context of of that, are you talking about in the context of marriage? Or as I dating? would say in the context of dating. For people okay. who are trying to figure out what's the appropriate thing uh, in terms of, you know, physical intimacy, for example, mm -hmm. and then, oh, no, like, am I doing something wrong? Am I, this, is God mad at me? Like, am gotcha. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like uh, we did mention, so there are, there are absolutes that you, you know, you hundred percent can't do. So, and then kind of, I guess, work your way back from there. Yeah. So obviously having sex is a no, no, uh, masturbation. No. Looking at <laughs> pornography. I love that he goes, no, <laughs> no. Right. So, I mean, there are, there are definite no's, right. You know, and then I guess I'm thinking, I'm thinking is, more like generally as well, of like, how do we get out of this attitude of fear? And and approach it more well, from a place of like. I, I did a talk on that the the other weekend. Oh, funny fear. that that should be the wow. case. What a transition, fear. James. Tell us about that. Fear. Didn't yeah, we do we, a talk? Didn't we do an episode? We of did. Fear? I titled this "Some of All Fears." Yeah, that was one of our most well played episodes. All right, See? that's why so, he brought me back. That's why I brought him back. So so yeah so a lot of people are dictated by fear. So then, what? So the point of my talk is, so there are many things that we fear. So it could be being fear, being lonely, fear, being rejected, fear of inadequacy. I mean, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. So it's, so if you are feeling scrupulous about, am I doing something wrong? If I like kiss her on the forehead, you know, <laughs> which I'm sure there are people out there who. Sorry, I didn't mean like, to. So for the listeners who are scrupulous about kissing people on the forehead, I'm sorry I just laughed at you. That was Don't worry, I won't invite him back. Please forgive time. me. But what so, if this is a well-received episode? Oh, man, you got to balance it, man. You have to balance it. I'm getting you but the no, views. But no, it really is about that self-mastery. So ju just recognize that you are in a relationship with another person. Again, it's having that open conversation too. Because if you're in, in a relationship with another person whose love language is physical touch and you're not touching them, then they probably think yeah, that you hate them. Yeah. You know? So, again, having that conversation, I'm not saying you're like, you need to be touching them all the time, but recognizing that if you are, are dating for the right reason, and this is something that you're serious about, then you have to also meet their needs. And again, I'm not saying go to the point of, the those automatic no's that we talked about but if you're gonna if you're gonna treat that person as you love them it's again to will the good of the other as other mm -hmm. and every person that you encounter has needs right and so it's it's meeting those person those people's needs obviously without sinning within the context of of also loving yourself and maintaining your dignity as well so you can't mm -hmm. forget that part as well so yeah if you are scrupulous about it i mean it's again i i think Sex in general is, is 
talked about in the in the context of especially like locker room talk with guys where it's just like hey like if you're not sleeping around you're kind of like a loser at least that was kind of my uh growing up like in high school and stuff i don't think you're a loser james thank you i appreciate that Dan. you're welcome but i was hoping I, you were I gonna think... give that back to me too but no <laughs> Okay. I'm on a roll, Dan. Right? You can't interrupt <laughs> keep me. Keep going. Keep going. You can't interrupt me. He's on a roll. So, but yeah, it. Oh shoot! Now I lost the roll. Locker room talk. Locker you're not. You're a loser talk. if uh, if you're not sleeping around, right? Oh yes. Okay, I found it again. So, but I think too when you talked about like the the ultra conservative folks, I think I think maybe they they're history or upbringing of mm-hmm. sex and sexu- sexuality mm-hmm. could have been one based on fear yeah. as well like if you if you kiss someone before you get married like you're going to hell type mm-hmm. of thing that's obviously an extreme example but i think you you might have an unhealthy relationship with whether it's physical touch or mm. sex or sexuality or, or things like that. So again, I mean, we keep talking about chastity, but in the greater context of it, again, it, it's that self mastery. So it's also recognizing your own weaknesses and just reflecting on, okay, so what do I need to work on? What do I struggle with? And then again, what we talked about as well is having someone that you can have that open conversation was like, Hey, I'm really having these thoughts. Like, am I crazy Yeah. or am I, is my conscious right? Am I on the right track here? Cause you might talk to somebody and they're like, dude, you need to lighten up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Or they might, you know, hear your whole story and be like, you know, you're, you're actually, you're thinking the right way, but here yeah. might be some things that you can work on. So did that answer your question? it did. And you gave me a uh, kind of a jumping off point and just s- some thoughts I'm, there's no video for this podcast, but James, the mic that he's using has uh, three points that it's standing on, and it kind of I keep coming back in my head, Trinity. yeah, to these kind of three points that it's just kind of resonating. The more I've thought about it since we discussed it earlier, just trusting your gut and your conscience, forming it in prayer and in study, like virtue is the fruit of prayer. We, I mean, people always talk about like, oh, I meditate five or 10 minutes a day or an hour a day or whatever. Um, and it really keeps me clear minded. Like prayer is a conversation with God. But in a lot of ways, that's it's the same thing as this meditation in a certain way that people are talking about. Yeah. It's quiet time with the God who is wisdom, right? Time to, to get through, clear through your thoughts, talk to God about them, bring them to him and just kind of be like, okay, is this examining our intentions, right? So trusting your gut, trusting your conscience, informing it well, right? That first part, communication with the person that you're dating with and and being open about it and communicating with someone that you trust that is not going to, you know, that's going to call you on your BS, you know, going to call you on, on when you're not being, I guess, authentic, genuine. genuine. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a really great uh, s- s- starting point, a really Absolutely. great yeah. Uh, frame of reference and i was thinking earlier too because we're talking about chastity but people are all, always kind of conflate it with purity like chastity and purity right. are the same thing mm-hmm. and in the and in the catechism it talks about the difference between chastity and purity you've already talked about chastity as a school and self-mastery but i think purity is a beautiful thing that i think is just slightly misunderstood i think purity people people just think purity is like oh yeah it's the same as chastity it's like not having sex or maybe not having sexual thoughts or something like that um the way purity has always been described to me is is sort of a being devoid of like attachments to certain things. Mm. Pure, like 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 pure water doesn't have anything muddying it up mm. or making it unclear. Like the pure heart is. It doesn't say the blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. That's the the beatitude. Can we look at that? I might be totally off base, but this idea of purity, whether it's purity of Heart, purity of intention, purity of speech. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Yeah, exactly. Because if your vision is pure, it's not obstructed by attachment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another thing. Purity can actually support chastity if you understand the difference between the two. Because if we're pure of heart and if we're pure of intention, it means we recognize why we're doing something. It goes back to the first question. So purity of intention, you understand what you're being motivated by. So like if I'm like, oh, I just want to have sex because, hey, it feels good. And this person is is willing to do it, right? Consent. It's cool, right? They're cool with it. And I want to do it. So good. Well, like 
examine your intention. Like, do I have a pure intention here? Am I actually seeking the good of this person or am I seeking just kind of something to gain from it? Mm. Right. And I mean, that's not just a sexual thing. That's in all of life. Right. I think looking for the, and praying for asking God for the virtue of purity can help in this area too, because purity is just being detached from these unhealthy motivations, I guess. Right. Removing obstacles to receiving Christ with, with joy. There's a beautiful, uh, uh, piece in, um, liturgy of the hours in Advent leading up to Christmas. And one of the prayers at the end, I don't remember when it is particularly, but the prayer goes something like, uh, help me to help remove all obstacles to receiving Christ with joy. And I think that's the summation of purity, removing all obstacles to receiving Christ with joy. Because if we really removed all these attachments of our of our phone and of all these petty desires that are just less than what we deserve as human beings, less than our dignity, and, and we really would be able to receive Christ with more joy, and it, and it would be more than we would ever even hope for or want. Um, I think purity is a beautiful foundation for chastity in that sense, because just recognizing our intentions and recognizing the obstacles to being able to I guess, achieve those, those good intentions. Mm. I don't know if any of that made sense, but I I love that. Sweet. Well, praise the Lord. Should we wrap up or can I ask you how it is in the dating world nowadays? Um, I think it's, I think it's full of potential and hope and also a little bit confusing and scary. I think especially being a Catholic too, like, man, I was not prepared for this question just because so so as Catholics, we have such particular understanding of the world that is very beautiful and it's grounded on so much goodness and truth, but it's also very countercultural. So yeah, it's hundred percent. So yeah, it's, it's hard to date and just be like, Hey, by the way, these are the things that I believe. And so like, do you compromise those things? And obviously my answer is absolutely. You can't, you can't compromise the truth just because, we desire love so much. Um, so it can be tricky. I mean, I can, I can imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. I've just noticed too, as I've gotten older that I'm much more set in my ways in certain, Mm -hmm. certain regards. So especially being Catholic, like you said, I mean, I guess in one way it's good, like you said, because it, you kind of sift through the wheat a little bit. Well, yeah, and it's, it's like, not something to be ashamed of or something oh, to be afraid of. Not. It's the it's yeah, the most beautiful thing in the world. Right. Right, but yeah, it can be difficult because I mean, just this whole conversation, it's like, well, like this is a this is absolute no for me. Mm-hmm. Or like this, you know, we have to wait until marriage type of thing and uh because I know some people too who, you know, are Christians or even some Catholics maybe who aren't as grounded in their faith, they mm-hmm. would be totally open to fornicating before marriage and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's gotta be tough. It's, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's tricky, but again, you know, it's, it's still worth it. And I would say even, even where mistakes are made in, in shortfalls, I always want to come back and say like, the Lord is merciful and like he desires your peace and, if you start to feel, and I just want to reemphasize that I'm kind of hammering this one, but like if you feel any, any shame or anything within this world that's making you go, Oh, well, I can't talk to God about this. That's, that's the devil. That's not God's voice. And like run to him, like just give it to him. Even if it's weird. I've had moments lately where it's like, I want to go to God and I'm like, I just feel like I can't talk to him about that. Just, really? just do it. Even though it's awkward, even really? if it's awkward. Yeah. yeah. Just moments of dryness where it's like, like he will receive it and be so overjoyed. And you'll be surprised, I think, if you're feeling far from him or you're feeling nervous about it, like bring it to him. And just even if it's super awkward, it's like when you get into like a fight with a friend and you like don't, it's super weird to talk to them, but you know, you need to like talk to them. Yeah. Bring, just bring it to him. Yeah. He I think, I think too, those moments where you, you feel the most awkward are going to bring the most beauty and goodness a hundred percent yeah so i mean again like like you talked about if if you are feeling that doubt or that shame like god doesn't want to hear this who do you think's talking to you at that point right. it's clearly not god right god wants to hear everything that's going on in your life he already knows yeah but he wants to walk alongside with you mm-hmm. every step of the way and again that's the foundation that we should have 
I was just listening to a talk, actually. Uh, it wasn't a Catholic speaker, but it was actually, a, I don't remember what the podcast was called, but it had some really, actually really great kind of wise nuggets for relationships. And one of the things they were talking is about like, oh, well, you need to kind of be confident on your own before you go into a relationship. And I think the only thing we can add to that is like, be confident in your relationship with God. That's the only relationship you truly need <laughs> Tr- truly again because we said yeah. like we were saying chastity goes across all spectrums all right. everything every human is called to that mm-hmm. um it's the only relationship that everyone has access to mm-hmm. and it's the most important one and that's the re- the most important relationship that we take with us right we're all going to die and be separated from each other in a certain sense um at least for for a brief space but that's the one that we're not separated from right and it's Having that foundation first will, I think, allow us to love a lot better once we're in the context of those relationships. Holding fast to that, having something beautiful to bring to that person, not being ashamed of it, not being afraid of it, um, just putting it out there, being who you are, being belonging to the Lord. And if people don't like that, then that's not the person. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> You know? That's so true. You got to be true to who you are. Again, because again, like you, we were saying, that the world, the dating world, as you say, is tricky. And I, it's, I mean, dude, I'm 32. <laughs> I have been in and out of relationships a lot, and I've learned a lot. But like, stick to your guns. Yeah. Like, I remember, very short story, and I'll stop. Uh, I went to a youth conference when I was, I worked. Uh, at Steubenville for the admissions department. And there was this one woman talking. She was just giving her testimony. She had just gotten married. She's 43. And she was like, I just want you to know it's worth it. You know, all this time that I waited and I prayed for my husband. And I'm not, I don't want to be like, everyone's going to find a spouse and it's going to be perfect and everything like that. But whether you do or whether you don't, creating that relationship with the Lord first and being able to share that is the foundation all of us should have first, no matter what is going to happen in our lives. So... Don't be afraid of it. Yeah, and 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 my sister too. She she got married. Um, jo, it's been two years, I think. But and same thing. She like mid thirties, but she has always was always praying for her spouse. Mm-hmm. And you know, she again, she got married a couple years ago. They they just had their first child. That's awesome. And. Again, just just having that relationship with God and being true to that. Yeah. Because my sister is is one of the most on fire people for Jesus. Yeah. And it, I mean, you could even make the argument that would she be as fire on fire for Jesus if she didn't have that waiting period? I was gonna say, is she happy that she waited? Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. Right. One hundred percent. And it's... he is like the most awesome guy you, you will ever meet. Right. And you know, it's almost like God saying, "Not yet." Like, trust me. Right, right. I have someone for you. Right. Um, keep your eyes on me. So, yeah. So always keep your eyes on. You. He's never going to let you down. And so because some of you out there, you're not going to be called to marriage, mm-hmm. and that might be extremely painful. But God has something better. Painful at first. Yes, painful at first. Painful transition. And yeah, we never want to neglect that pain either. But also, when you when you stick with Jesus, he he will bring so much fruit and grace that you just cannot imagine. And my brother living out his priesthood too. Like, I think it's only painful because we don't understand our relationship with the Lord as well as we should and as well as we still can. Like, we only see like, oh, marriage and family is the only way that we can experience love. And I just want to invite you to explore the love that God is offering through every vocation. It's pretty crazy. 100%. It's beautiful. But hard and painful. Absolutely. It's a process. Any other nuggets for the for the men out there and women? Out yeah, there? Um, I'm gonna say a prayer for y'all tonight. Yes, let's do it. I mean, I was gonna do it later, but we can do it now. Let's do it now. Let's pray Hail Mary now for all the people listening. Let's do it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. So go out there and be a saint. Thank you all so much for tuning in to another episode of The Manly Catholic. 
If you have not already done so, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. It will also help grow the show and reach as many men as possible. We truly think this podcast can change families and help men to change the world. Thank you again so much for tuning in and God bless you.